actually very pleased to introduce uh, Richard Node. Um, he's from Ottawa now, but he uh, did his uh, a lot of his training in in uh, Canada. Did his masters, a bachelor's and masters at McGill, and then uh, the PhD under uh, Wolfram Gerstner at EPFL, and studying uh, kind of statistical models for neuron neuron dynamics, and actually um, kind of like championed a kind of a, a challenge for characterization of. Uh, kind of neural firings and something that was kind of a, in many ways similar to kind of I think a parallel to the morphology reconstruction things that were done at Genelia and perhaps another important piece of that, that puzzle. Um, I run the modeling analysis and theory group here um, at the Institute, been here a long time and so I'm very pleased to have associates, new associates like him to help us in, in terms of helping to guide our kind of uh, ideas and our work here and uh, he's going to uh, talk to us today about uh, some of his recent work I believe. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. So, um, thank you so much first for uh, inviting me. I mean, it's thrilling to talk with everyone here and get to know all the projects. It's really inspiring also to, for me. And I hope that it's just the start of something great. Um, and, all right, my lab. Um, we're bu building mathematical neuron models of uh, neurons at different levels of description, so neurons and populations, and we try to link, try to link those different levels of description in mathematical neuron models um, from the understanding we have of molecules, ion channels, and so on, uh, to neural networks, to hopefully behavior. Um, and um, we also are focusing a lot on the link between those mathematical neural models and the data that we can uh, have. And we're using the models to test hypotheses, particularly on the neural code. And I've worked a lot on adaptation. Um, but today I'm going to speak about something slightly different because, and something not published uh, that I find really intriguing and I'm really excited and I hope I'll get some feedback by coming here. Um, so somewhere, somewhere in my brain, uh, when I look at that picture, there uh, information about those pixels that is encoded. Um, and somewhere else, uh, or somewhere in the brain, there's a knowledge about whether this is a duck or a rabbit uh, that is also being encoded. And somewhere, those two sources of information are combined. Um, and you typically think that they must just be combined and then you have one resulting answer. Uh, but what I'd like to talk to you about today is that neurons have the machinery to be able to represent those two sources of information simultaneously. A, pop a single population of neurons can represent at the same time one st two streams of information or operation on those two streams. So, to, uh, to get to that, um, uh, first, there are two uh, features of the neocortical neural code that I'd like to, to bring. First, the neuro neocortical neural code is fast. So, if I ask you to see whether there's an animal in that picture, um, from the photons getting to the retina, going all the way to V1 where you have simple features being coded and then traveling up the cortex in the hierarchy, uh, realizing that there is some higher order feature like an animal there, and then comparing it with the goal uh, of deciding whether there's an animal and reporting it, planning the motor action and saying, yes, there's an animal. Just in transmission delays, there's 200 milliseconds. And that leaves 200 milliseconds, roughly, uh, sorry, and you can do that task in 400 milliseconds. So that leaves 200 milliseconds for 10 stages of encoding and decoding uh, with the populations of neurons. That's roughly 10 to 20 milliseconds per stage. Um, and so the way we think that this can be done is to work in groups, to work in ensembles. Uh, so there's this, it's much a theoretical construct uh, you, you think of a group of cells that are encoding the same thing. Uh, this is typically hard to record from experimentally because some of these cells might not be next to each other. Um, but you can think of these cells receiving some fluctuating intensity of light in the retina or in V1. Uh, and, and these population of cells will then respond 
with action potentials in time, voltage traces, are, these are three examples from, a, imagine a large population of cells. Um, and if you count the number of action potential at every moment of time, you get an estimate of what we call the ensemble firing rate. Uh, it's not the same as the time average firing rate, uh, and mainly because this firing rate can represent the stimulus very fast. So this is something that the theoretical community has been working on for a long time, and it, it's, you can uh, basically respond on, uh, on a time scale that's faster than the membrane time constant. Um, and the nice and acute thing about this ensemble rate code is that neurons have the machinery to read that code. So if you think of a neuron postsynaptic to that population, uh, it sums excitatory postsynaptic potentials and it's basically some, uh, making an estimate of that firing rate in time. Um, the second thing I'd like to mention, so this is a unidirectional picture. Uh, I was talking about two uh, types of inputs, and where does that idea come from? It comes from the idea that the brain is um, hierarchical. Hubel and Wiesel said that uh, you can create the selectivity for bars from the selectivity of points, um, and so you can think of the cortex as representing higher and higher order features like this. And so from that mess of connections, you can distinguish two types of connections. Those that go up the hierarchy, the bottom up, and those that go down. So I'll just label them in two colors. Uh, those that go up now will be blue, and those that go down are red. Um, and how does that come together? Um, well, the, the, the classical uh, picture is that of gain modulation. Uh, the, the firing rate, uh, in the presence of top-down feedback of some higher order feature being uh, uh, there, is, m is multiplying the, uh, the firing rate without that feedback, that top-down input, uh, by a certain factor. Um, now, I'd like to stress that this is ambiguous. You've lost track of where the input came from. You lost track of the direction. The firing rate is a single dimension. You just have one bit of information. Well, um, and so I've been working on, a, I was mostly working on a different uh, level. Uh, and it, to address that problem, I'm going locally to a, a one population, population of cells, a layer five pyramidal cells that we've heard about already twice from, the, from Mark and Simona. Um, and um, they are useful because they are thought to uh, combine two streams of information. So at the more proximal uh, regions, you get input traveling up the hierarchy. And mostly, I mean, this is still an approximation. You can, some discussion can be uh, done there. But you have another type of input coming to the apical dendrites really far up, maybe one millimeter away from the somatic region. So I use that as a, as a, as a model of uh, a way to study the neural code, uh, how the, the, the neurons represent those two streams of information. Um, and I was mostly working on one particular feature of those neurons, uh, which is that if you stimulate a single cell, such, such a layer five pyramidal cell, uh, strongly, it will create an action potential, and you at the same time, uh, you have a strong input in the apical dendrite. Then depending on the timing of that input to the dendrite, uh, you might create a burst. This single spike will, create, will be converted into a burst because the, um, the input in the apical dendrite coincides with the back action potential, which is enough to trigger a calcium spike or some uh, local nonlinearity. And then if the input is slightly off again, you just lose that spike. Um, so you can see the burst as signaling a coincidence between those two streams. I see that as slightly differently. You have always a single spike, an event, and this is converted into a burst depending on what's happening in the dendrites. Uh, that's the intuition that I'll be working on uh, at the ensemble level. So, let me explain how I think these things 
will work. So the classical neuron code, you'd say there's just firing, so spike times, uh, irrespective of whether they're in a burst or not. Uh, you might argue or not that a burst means something different. There's a different semantic to it. Um, and that's what I would like to say now. It is, the burst is something different from a single spike, and both can be said to be event. And a burst is stereotypical. Uh, typically in vivo, if you look at the spike trains, you have two, di two different um, types of intervals, short intervals below 15 milliseconds, and those that are longer intervals uh, that you'd call the single spike. Um, and um, these, uh, th these bursts are very typical. There's, there's always, pretty much always two spikes, sometimes three spikes, but 90% of those bursts are two spikes. Um, but so how does that, this, what does that mean at the level of the ensemble? The classical neuron code, as I was showing you before, uh, you would simply count the number of spikes at every moment of time. This is the classical firing rate. Uh, you can think of the event rate, the ensemble event rate, which would basically, this is the, yeah. So, this is a burst, but it's a single event. So I count one event, and I count that at every moment of time. And note that this will, this represents something different, some other signal in time. You can always, you can also talk about the burst rate at the ensemble level. So those three signals might be different. Um, and then um, you can also think of operations on those two. You can think of uh, the burst probability as the burst rate divided by the event rate uh, to represent the probability of an event being converted into a burst. And these, these ensemble quantities can represent different things. Um, and that's what I, I, I pose that um, as a, a, a way to uh, represent two streams of information. And it, it comes from previous intuition by Francis Crick and, and Christoph Koch, where they were talking, they were saying a synchrony of bursts might be uh, mediating top-down uh, attention. Uh, but I, that idea hasn't picked up that much afterwards. And maybe it's just because of a different way of parsing uh, the single spikes and the bursts, because typically you separate single spikes and bursts, but to mediate two different um, streams of information, you need to use two independent compartments. And since a single spike and a burst are first started by the same mechanism, they're dependent. So instead, the event, the generation of an event, and the probability of converting that event into a burst can be two independent uh, mechanisms. So this is, a, this is how I think it could work. Uh, you have, say you have some input that is a injected to the somatic compartment of a population of an ensemble of cells. Uh, they would then re respond with a series of action potential. If you count the, the event rate, that event rate is representing the somatic input. Um, now, there's more information in whether the event was a burst or not. And in that first bin, the single event there was is converted into a burst. So uh, you can look at the burst probability by calculating the fraction of the, the burst rate divided by the event rate. And, and it might be representing the dendritic input. Um, and so f that could be a way to represent two streams of information. Now, to test this, I test this with my models. I have uh, single neuron models that have two compartments, uh, a leaky integrated fire model uh, in the soma and an active uh, compartment that in the dendrite that uh, generates calcium spikes that I've calibrated on data uh, previously. And this model basically creates single spikes or bursts, and you can inject uh, current. And there's, I put a background of uh, input to, to mimic the in vivo situation, and I try to make sure that those cells are in an in vivo state by having the proper firing rate and, and other uh, statistical features of the spike trains. And then I, I simulate a population of those cells, 4,000 cells, um, and I, calc I inject some current all the same to all the somatic and dendritic compartments to recreate the ensemble. Um, and I calculate the event rate, burst rate, and all those statistics. And I ask, well, say if I inject those alternating current. Red current is the current I injected in the dendrite. 
and the blue current is a current I injected in the summa, and I alternate like this, and slightly uh, shifted, so that there's also an overlap. And then those neurons will fire with, the, here I show a uh, hundred of those 4,000 neurons, the points are action potentials in time, They're, they fire fairly stochastically, uh, and you can calculate the classical neuron call of looking at the firing rate. And this is relatively uninformative because the dendritic and somatic compartment compensate for each other. You have some peaks here that relate to the times where both are at the same time, and that uh, reflects the gain modulation that's going on. However, if I remove all the second and third spikes into a burst, and I said I look only at the event, then I recover uh, the somatic input. Um, and you can then also look at another feature, say the burst rate, um, by looking only at the time where they were burst, so bursts were there, uh, and a, a average over the 4,000 cell, you get something that is slightly closer to the dendritic input, but it is still uh, gain modulated if you want uh, at the time where you have a combination of both. Uh, but I was arguing that you can maybe recover directly the dendritic input by dividing the burst rate by the event rate, so the orange by the blue. And if I do this, well, I recover, uh, and now I can superpose those, the input, I recover the temporal structure that I injected in the dead rate and temporal structure invented, injected into the soma. So in that particular case, I really extract much more information. Now I'm, I've paused myself in a, in a very particular case where the ambiguity was maximal. Uh, but still, we've worked uh, and tried to see the advantage of that code, and it, when you have a large population, you can indeed double the inf amount of information uh, in bits per second uh, that you get compared to uh, the firing rate. Um, and, and we've showed then with simulations uh, that this is consistent with the dynamics of the single neurons. Um, so this is my first uh, message that you can represent two streams of information by looking at the spike trains in a slightly different way. But that might not be uh, so useful if the neurons themselves or the rest of the neural system is not able to read that code. Uh, this information must be decodable, if you'd like, uh, by neurons neighboring that, that cell population. And so, to do this, you need to have some type of filtering on the interspike interval, uh, of, of the interspike interval on a spike train by spike train basis. And you might need also a division. Uh, so these processes are not so hard to find uh, in the biology. So you need first that a burst and a single spike would do the same postsynaptic effect. So that the, the second and third spike in the burst, when they come in a high interspike interval, are filtered out. Uh, this, something that would look like this, and this is um, known as short-term depression. Um, <clears throat> and this, these layer five pyramidals connect to, I mean, this is, a, I'm using the tripartite uh, the classification of cells. Uh, you would say it's way too uh, simplified, but I have to start somewhere, given that the, the cell um, uh, project here is, uh, is not completely, uh, uh, hasn't completely given us the different neuron types, but so the PV and VIP positive cells receive typically short-term depression. Um, and then you also have short-term facilitation in the, in the, the somatostatin positive cells, uh, and this would, argue, would be useful for being selective more to bursts than single spikes. And this can work on the ensemble level. Um, so I've tested whether this can make sense in simulations. So again, I use uh, a model that's previously published for short-term plasticity. Uh, or, um, and I test whether a, a cell population postsynaptic to that population of 4,000 excitatory cell can represent either of those two streams. And I inject again my alternating input just to illustrate whether I can resolve the ambiguity. So without short-term plasticity, uh, is something fairly hard to, to read. Um, if I add short-term facilitation, 
and I look at the postsynaptic firing rate of that population in orange, I get something that was looking a lot like the burst rate before uh, that follows more the, the red, the dendritic input. If I, if I look, if I put short-term facilitation in those synapses, uh, the postsynaptic firing rate decodes only the somatic input. So it's been, it's been able to filter out the information coming at different spatial location on that neuron. Um, so that's for getting the somatic input, but to get the dendritic input, I was dividing the burst rate by the event rate to get that burst probability, the probability of an event being converted into a burst. That requires a division. Um, but division is not something either that is completely impossible with neurons. There's a divisive inhibition, and there's a regime where inhibition acts divisively. So what you would need is that this blue population would provide divisive inhibition on the, short, uh, on the orange population. And if you do that, and you stay in a regime where the, the inhibition is acting divisively, you do recover uh, the dendritic input stream uh, to some degree. So this information, I conclude, is that this information is accessible to, to, to neurons given known physiology. Um, and that was the superposition of that input. So if you interpret the somatic input that I was showing you in my simulation and the dendritic input as a bottom-up or top-down input, it could be any other type of combination of input, um, the neurons have the machinery to represent both the, somati the, the, the somatic input, so the bottom-up input, uh, the top-down input, or a combination of both, which would be the firing rate or the burst rate. Um, and that's what I call multiplexing, uh, or burst ensemble multiplexing. Um, it's, uh, it's a different neural code, and you can think of multiple processes or me mechanisms that can be thought in a multiplex way or can uh, be uh, interpreted with multiplexing, like competition between two population of cells uh, that might be receiving common inhibition from any of those inhibitory cell types. So you can think about multiplex uh, competition. You can also think about these cells are projecting back to the dendrites, providing some particular feedback that is the negative feedback that is matched to exactly what's coming in so, uh, and being able to act as a, and create a detailed balance both in the soma and the dendrites, so multiplex balance. These are just ideas uh, that we can test with simulations, also with experiments, uh, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to <laughs> working in those uh, directions. And with this, uh, I'd just like to thank Henning Sprechla, which uh, with whom I've done most of that work in Berlin, uh, but also in Ottawa, where I'm now, and some of uh, my collaborators, particularly Matthew Larkum and Alba Guidon, with whom I've discussed these things extensively. Thank you. We have time for some questions. There should be microphones available, I think. Uh... Hi, Richard. Uh, great talk. So Thank you showed you. us how you can uh, deconvolve the spikes and the bursts, but only for one particular frequency. The mechanisms which you're using are frequency dependent. If you're going to try to pass an arbitrary signal through that to do the uh, multiplexing, do you think that you're going to have trouble at uh, particular frequencies depending uh, it, on it the system? might very well be the case. That's something to test. Yeah, um, yeah. it's a good question. I haven't, it's true that the, the decoding, I've, so the, I've, show, I've tried in my simulations and with that particular model, this slowly, well, relatively slowly switching stimulus. I've tried also with much faster, like 10 millisecond uh, switches, but I haven't looked at the range and whether you have artifact coming in through the different frequency dependencies, dependencies of short-term plasticity. It might also be that the, I mean, we never know completely if that specific model is the good one for those particular synapses. Um, yeah. And a short follow-up, what would be the best falsifiable predictions you can make to try to test if this is actually used in vivo? Yeah, 
Um, that's a, I've get, I get that question all the time and I don't really have an answer. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'd like to, I mean, I'd like to sit down with an, if a great experimentalist and just discuss the possibilities for two, three nights maybe, or maybe the, the person's just gonna go right away and tell me. Uh, I would say it's some, there are two predictions there. Uh, one is that the burst fraction would relate to something more top down and the event rate would be related to something more bottom up. So that is testable. Um, if you can measure this in a fairly large population, which is sometimes tricky, um, and a, an ensemble. And the other thing is that this, these two streams of information will be represented in different types of interneurons, inter and that's m maybe slightly more uh, possible. Um, yeah. uh, Rebecca. Is that um, what you're talking about, like when you're talking to someone and you think of something and then you start to listen to him and, in, and then you forget it, what would that be like? Maybe, that's just a model. Uh, <laughs> would that be like a burst? Um, that's, so, so, so to be fair, I, I'm not working so much at the high end level. I'm really working on single cells and I'm trying to understand how this can make sense, this bursting. Uh, mechanism and the, the, the physiology. I'm really working on from the, the bottom up in terms of level of description and that's the, the, the thing that you're saying here is how I think of it is the way I can think it makes sense uh, but I, I'm far from being uh, an expert in those uh, higher... We have a question in the back uh, first. One, one second, Anton. Uh, Rebecca, do you have a question? No, no, I don't have a question. I'm <laughs> She's just holding the mic. Whoever holds the microphone wins. Go ahead. No, no, I don't have a question. I'm just, I'm just handing out the microphone. Oh, you're handing the microphone. Okay, Anton. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm just curious. This model that you described, um, you investigated it in a purely feed-forward regime. Um, what do you think, would, would, would these mechanisms survive uh, if it was a you know, fully recurrently connected network? Yeah, so I bypass the recurrence of the excitatory cell to so excitatory cell by injecting that, that background noise current. And I, the, the rationale for this is that if you connect, if you put, if you connect excitatory cells together, uh, this is an explosive mix, as you know. And so you need to put the inhibition. And, and then the inhibition is matching the excitation, doing that balancing. And that creates basically just noise because you have the, the mean is canceled out and all that's left is the variance, right? Um, and so that's why, that's the rationale I've done. I, I strongly believe, I don't see why it wouldn't work, uh, but that's one of the areas that we're pursuing right now. We're just doing the full thing. Very nice talk. I was wondering if you had an idea about the implications of such mechanisms in the context of learning. And if you had, so if you had some plasticity rules that depends on which code you have, like how, how would that work in a certain sense? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. It's indeed, like you can, ensemble and assembly are two very similar words and one is more in the plasticity world, and so I'd like to one day go from burst ensemble multiplexing to burst assembly multiplexing, because there's a lot of evidence that the bursts are really important to trigger plasticity, and then without the burst, you actually don't have plasticity, uh, or there might be a different type of plasticity, maybe the plasticity working on that lower layer of the neural code is just homeostatic, and the, the one on top layer is actually the one where you're associating things. Yeah, that's a good question. Question: can, can you tell us a little bit about the, the neural challenge and the, what the outcomes of that was? And, and the yeah, so I'm using um, fairly simple neuron models. They're integrated fire models with adaptation, uh, and as a dendritic compartment. But uh, we were when I started my PhD, I was supposed to just like model the diversity of cell types and classify them. Roughly, what you're doing That's right all? now. That's uh, all. Just that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no PhD for you. Right. <laughs> My PhD was not about that at all, <laughs> for obvious reasons. <laughs> uh, but one thing we did is to, because the first problem when you try to do that is to choose a model. Uh, which model do you choose? And which model, and, uh, and which model you choose depends not only on whether the model is good, but also whether you can actually say it is good. 
uh, so whether you can fit it to data. So instead of doing all that work by ourselves, we said, well, we ask all the experts for the different models to bring in their best contribution and their best prediction of, mm -hmm. of neural activity. And the bottom line of this is that, uh, well, integrated fire models are not good uh, alone. They were predicting 40%, 50% of the spikes. Um, and uh, you need to add adaptation. You need to add a sp the spike-triggered process that prevents you from spiking if you spiked before. Um, and if you do that, and you have, you have multiple time, time scale to adaptation, you predict 80%, 90%, 100% of the spike, depending on the cell types. And if you ask with a complicated Hodgkin Oxley based model with complicated morphology and different ion channel types, is able to uh, uh, predict the activity and you use a model that's been fitted uh, um, uh, with a big computer, you also predict 80%, 90% of the spikes. So it, the, 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 the performance was the same for the intricate and fire um, versus the detailed model. Mm. However, uh, non one thing that this, the, the integrate and fire are really not good at is the spatial dimension. They have no spatial dimension, right? And so we, the, the data that I've used now to characterize that model is dual injection, one in the apical dendrite and one in the somatic uh, compartment. That's just one step ahead. And I, I've shown that with a simple two compartment, you can predict the activity with 80% uh, precision. Yeah. Other questions? I guess let's thank a speaker one more time and we'll have a <laughs> very nice. Very nice. Excellent, yeah.